Floor, please. Oh, what a shot. Oh, yes. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Four Please Now Driving, the official Masters podcast. I'm your host, Marty Smith from ESPN. It is overcast and at times drizzly here at Augusta National, but the weather does not deter the Masters magic for the patrons in attendance. Donning their Masters logoed rain jackets, they come from all over the world in droves to see their heroes defy logic on the grandest stage. As Justin Thomas said, the course is in really good shape. It's firm, it's fast. Can't do much about the weather the rest of the week, but I'm sure the green staff is very, very pleased with the course conditions. As always, the stunning beauty of Augusta National has a distinct way of masking its difficulty. Thomas went on to say that so many shots or holes can look like they're right in front of you, but they never truly are. It's never that easy. The Masters demands precision and patience from its participants. And when they find that combination and couple it with consistency, history happens. Very few people have witnessed more history here than Vern Lundquist. The CBS sports broadcasting icon has provided the soundtrack to some of the most memorable moments in sports history. He called the kick six in the Iron Bowl. He called Grant Hill to Christian Leitner in the Elite Eight and he called two of the most outstanding moments in Masters history. I walked out to the scene of one of those moments, the 16th hole, to learn from the legend. In your life have you seen anything like that? Vern Lundquist is a legend, an icon, a great friend, someone I've admired for so long. That means I'm old, Marty. (laughs) (laughs) As we stand here sort of at the precipice of your 40th and final Masters, when I say those words, what what stands out? Well, I'll reach down here and grab the inner part of my thigh to keep from getting emotional. (laughs) Uh, It it will be an emotional week. There's just no doubt, no way to escape that. But I've had two years to get ready for it. Uh, Sean McManus, our boss, at C- the chairman at uh, CBS Sports, Sean and I got together a couple years ago, and he and I had collaboratively uh, decided when to end SEC football. We had collaboratively decided when to end basketball, and so we collaboratively, two years ago, he said, what do you think? And I said, well, 40's got a nice round sound to it, so uh, this will be it. Uh, and I'm looking forward to the whole week. I've had two years to get ready. So I'm reasonably. Well, something good just happened. Well, I think it was, <laughs> I think they just said, they just said it was my final masters. And <laughs> the crowd is going, yes, uh, sir. Yes, but, oh, well played. <laughs> sorry, well it just played. sat there, Marty. Well played, I just right there had, on the I, I can't, couldn't ignore it. But, uh, you know, given, having been given two years to, to prepare, prepare for this week. Uh, I think I'm ready. When, when uh, you walked in here today and, and you're sitting here, we're sitting here on 16 watching these guys have a blast. What, what, I mean, how do you, what, what is the, the emotion even today? Well, anticipation, uh, a little dread because I don't want to get emotional on the air. I know it's going to happen. I know it's going to come, but I'm going to try and stifle any, any uh, expression of emotion. It's, this is the Masters for crying out loud. And, but to be back here for this. Uh, I love this place. I do too. I mean, it's just so special. Uh, well, right here, I mean, on this tower back here, you sit here and I can see third shots here. I can see the tee shots at, at six. I can look down and see the, the tee shots at 17. It is a magical place to And sit it's here. been your home. Yeah. For all these years. 25 years. 25 years. Yeah. Let's just discuss, I, w- I want to discuss the most famous of okay, those moments sure. in just a moment. But when you walk in here, there's a magic. You've done it all. You've been at every major sporting moment in the last 40 years, but there's something here, sir, that just feels yeah. magical. It's, what they're, is it? They're, they're, they're playing practice round behind yeah. it. And somebody is doing 
really well right now. Uh -huh. Tony Finau. Tony, is it Tony? Tony's trying to skip that thing oh, across. Oh, yeah. I oh, you got a good one. You got a good one. Oh! That's great, Marty. I, I got to share something with you. Oh, 10, 15 years ago, I watched VJ tee off and tried to skim it. It bounced four times, rolled up, went back left, hole in one with four skips. Pretty memorable. It's another thing that makes this place yeah, so special is the roars and the people and the history and the reverence that all of us carry when we're in here. There, there's, there's no place in my life quite like this, uh, this Masters tournament. And uh, I, I, I'm hoping that Sean, is, Sean McMahon is my boss. I'm hoping he's going to say, well, why don't you come back for next year? There we go. And, he, and then I'm going to say, yeah, I'd love to. And he said, but it's on your dime. <laughs> You're going to pay for We're it. We're going to start the campaign now. Let's okay, do a yeah. GoFundMe for Vern to come <laughs> back next year. Two of the most iconic calls in sports history were yours right here. Let's start at 17 in 1986. I want you to walk me through the entire experience of Jack Nicholas' magical run. Well, do you have an hour? <laughs> <laughs> we got time. Well, especially your part at 17. Well, thanks. Uh, thanks, Marty. Uh, Jack began the day four shots behind Seve, and uh, he really had a very mundane first eight holes. And there's a wonderful story about this. Frank Trakinian, the Ayatollah, who was our producer. Lance Barrow, who later succeeded Frank as the producer, was in the second row of the truck. Lance is a man of large girth, and his nickname was Buddha. So uh, Trakinian was the Ayatollah, and Jack birdied nine, right? And, and Lance said, uh, Frank, we've got Jack with a birdie on nine. And Frank stood up and turned around. And he said, Buddha, listen to me. We're telling stories here. And Jack Nicholas is not part of this story. OK, he birdies 10. Lance <laughs> said, <clears throat> Frank, we got Jack with a birdie at 10. And Frank just stood up, turned around, and just glared at him. Uh, birdie 11. Frank, we got Jack with three birdies in a row. Okay, play them back. So we saw <laughs> 9, 10, and 11, and I promise you, Marty, Jack did not take a step on Augusta National that was not documented on CBS or the rest of the way. And he just had an extraordinary second nine. So now at the age of 46, with no, no wins in two years, with those ugly plaid pants and that big putter. They were pretty bad, weren't oh, they? Oh, gosh almighty. <laughs> and, and, and uh, he hit his tee shot way over to the left uh, near the seventh green. And I knew now, uh, Jack, I don't think he was a scoreboard watcher, but he's tied for the lead. And he pitches on, he's got a 12 foot putt, kind of a double breaker. And I just said, uh, you know, if he makes it, if this is for sole possession of the lead. So he hits the putt and being bold and aggressive, it's that far from the hole. And I said, maybe. Well, no kidding. <laughs> no kidding, maybe. And then when it went in, I, I said, yes, sir, with a little more emphasis than that. And uh, It's just iconic, sir. Well, it, I, I just, you know. Do you ever sit there and think, I can't believe that's me? <laughs> well, I was reacting. I, again, you got to be reactive. You can't be proactive. So uh, I just, I, you know, I, with a lot of emphasis. I mean, I was thrilled for oh, Jack. It was, a, it was, a, it yeah, was one yeah. of these, and man. There was a little emphasis to it. <laughs> but uh, I hope to see Jack this week. And uh, we're inexorably tied together uh, because of his putt and what I said in the air. And I, 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 th I understand he's going to be at Augusta all week long. So I'm hoping to see him and say thank you. But I know Jack pretty well. I don't know Tiger that well, it's just age difference. And, but uh, I know Jack quite well. But yet you are also inextricably linked with Tiger for the rest of time yeah. because of 2005 on the 16th. I kind of remember that. I hope so. I it's, the greatest, it's the greatest golf shot ever. Well, in my view it is. This was at Augusta for crying <laughs> yes. out loud. And, uh, when he stood over the ball, Lanny Watkins was in the tower at 18. And Lanny and I were going back and forth. And I said, and Chris DeMarco was his fellow competitor at the time. 
And Chris had hit 20 feet below the hole. And uh, I asked Lanny what he thought, well, as Tiger was getting ready to hit the chip shot. And Lanny said, he'll be, re he'll be lucky if he can keep this inside DeMarco's ball. So he hits the chip and here it comes. And you know, he, 25 feet above the hole, it starts to dribble, tumble down, and it sits on the lip of the cup. Yeah. You just kind of got to look. Yeah, you know? like I you know. Just gotta, you just you, you got to look yeah. because it's... It... Yeah. It sat there for 1.8 seconds, and it, it tumbled down. And then I was reactive. I said, in your life, have you ever seen anything like that? Because I hadn't. And I thought people at home certainly had never. And, and then to watch Tigers, and there's another part of the story. Uh, up in the tower was a guy who's retired now, Bob Wishney. And Bob and I, well, on Wednesdays, we'd come out here and I'd just get in the tower and Bob and I would talk and, and uh, we'd, we'd get together. And he showed me they, they put brand new cameras on the main camera location for any, every hole on the second nine. And he said, this has got a new zoom lens, 101 to one. And he zoomed in on somebody put a nickel down here 20 feet, and, and we, he zoomed in and we could read it, In God We Trust 2002. And he said the other thing is they put horizontal stabilizers on here so that when you get excited and you jump up, the camera won't shake, the tower won't shake, and I won't get yelled at. And so sure enough, here comes the ball, tumbles down, sits on the lip, drops in, and I stood up and went, yeah, in your life, and the, the, if you see the replay, there's a little like that. That was me, and Wishy just stared at me. Well, like, if you're human, if you're a human being in that energy and all of that just beautiful moment, yeah. you got to do that. Well, I, and, and I have to share one thing. I don't, I don't collect autographs. You and I can't do that because we pretend we're sure. professionals, sure. right? But Jax was so special, and Tigers was so special. So I sent a photograph to Jack, and he signed it uh, to Vern, yes, sir, with a smiley awesome. face. Boom. And then I talked to Mark Steinberg, uh, Tiger's, Tiger's rep, Tiger's and I Tiger. said, uh, I know you get inundated with these requests, but this is a pretty special moment. And Mark said, I agree, send it up here. So Tiger signed it for me. And I've got the two of them. Uh, when, when I pass, and my wife does, uh, all of my memorabilia is going to my alma mater, Texas Lutheran University. And those two photographs will go down there. And uh, I can't wait to see how they're going to be displayed. Well, I will tell you, um, your grace, the way that you've carried yourself ever since I've known you and even before I was around, hmm. everyone that has the blessing of being in your presence always compliments what a wonderful gentleman you are and have always been. You are such a beautiful ambassador, not just for sport oh, wow. and not just for the masters, but how a gentleman should carry himself. To see you're gonna make me tear up right here. <laughs> I'm trying my damnedest. <laughs> <laughs> Thank Congratulations you, Thank you, Marty. on 40 legendary years. Thank you so and much. And I can't wait until this weekend yeah. so we can hear you do it one well, last time. I can't wait either. I can't wait either. Have a wonderful week. Thank you, Marty. Appreciate you, Thank sir. Thank you so much. As we chatted, standing there on the fairway, Bobby Jones named Red Bud, I couldn't help but turn around several times and peek at the green, where so many of Vern's legendary calls echo with the ghosts. At another point this week, I was walking the 16th with the likes of Jordan Spieth and Sergio Garcia, the 2015 and 2017 Masters champions respectively, as they thrilled the patrons with another great Masters tradition, skipping golf balls across the pond and up onto the 16th green. Spieth told me as we neared the water's edge that he's mastered the craft. And for the record, his shot backed it up. Roger Steele is a great friend of mine, a golf personality who is really doing great content, brother. It's so fun to watch. And I just learned a brand new dad. Congratulations. Brand new. Oh, I appreciate you. Don't congratulate me yet. Let's see how I do with the whole fatherhood. You're going to be amazing at it with your grace and the way you carry yourself and your personality uh it, it's it's the it's the most difficult most rewarding responsibility that we can have as men i feel it and it's the best 
I don't feel the best part, but I do feel. I, I, I feel <laughs> no the sleep. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, I was I was telling the baby, I'm trying to whisper these things to her, hoping some of this stuff resonates. I'm like, sleep deprivation is a war tactic. It's a torture <laughs> tactic. You know what I mean? You're torturing daddy right now. Why don't you just go to sleep? But uh, no, it has been a, a very beautiful process. Like the growth that you go through. You know, now that you have to care for something that literally needs you to survive, and I've just never had that amount of pressure on me before. And so, trying to figure out who I am now that that's the circumstance has been, it's, it's been you know changing for me. But deciding to come down here though, you know, she's only a month old. She she made a month on Sunday, and uh, we were we were talking about it. You know, we were trying to line up the timelines. Like, okay, you're pregnant now. That was really the only thing we were thinking about. <laughs> Augusta's in April. <laughs> the baby's coming in March. Do we think that we could? So I didn't really push her on it. You know, push push my lady on it. But then you know, when it got time, it was just. You know, I, I love being a dad, and it did give me a little guilt to slip down here away from her. But this this experience is just is special. It's very special to be down here. That's you know? the power yeah. of the masters. What you just said, it okay? Is, we're is babies do here. Yeah. The masters <laughs> just, is here. Let's just, see if we can get on with this, please. Should, should, should we induce her a little early <laughs> just to make sure we get a? Should we? You know what I mean? It's just it's interesting the concessions that you try to make to to make sure that you can make this trip every year. But it, every time you come down, it is worth it. Okay, so how do you describe the Masters to somebody who hasn't lived it? Uh, I just think that you know this is the this is the ultimate golf experience on every front that you could think of, right? As a player, this is everything that you want to win. This is what you grow up fantasizing in your head. You sinking a putt on eighteen to to you know win something. It's always talk about a green jacket. Uh, you know, once you get down here as a fan, as a patron, you know, as a as a spectator, uh, there's just no stone left unturned as far as the attention to detail. And it's just something that no matter how many times I watched this, you know, I, watching uh, the Masters on Sunday with my father was just a, a household tradition. You know, every Sunday we sat in his room, I sat on his bed, and we just watched the Masters, you know, and uh it's amazing for all of those years that I watched it on TV and how much I thought I understood what Augusta looked like when you get down here. It's like, oh. I mean, it's just a whole different Whole thing. different ball it's game. The greenest green you've ever seen. Like, what it's, shade of green is this? It's the most – and, and you, you noted the attention to detail. Everything is perfection. Yeah. I looked at a, a blade of grass that was leaning over a little too hard and it stood up, stood back in place. Yeah, yeah you had to <laughs> kind of poke it over just a little bit. <laughs> Um, it's funny you talk about your time with your dad and, and those those moments that you had with him. I had the same ones. I think that's a, a certainly a, um, applicable for so many people, and it's relatable for so many people. What is it about the generational aspect of this that's so special? I don't know. I just think that, like, it, it's kind of baked. To me, it seems to be baked into, you know, the history of Augusta, right? Like, Augusta has always seemed like a place where they respect tradition, but it always evolves, right? And, you, and if you think about the father-son bond, it's really like, you know, your father always represents, you know, some form of tradition and you become an evolution of him. And it's like this passing of the torch. And the thing that's always amazed me about the, the club and about the tournament is that they continue to evolve in a way that respects tradition, but there's always evolution. You know, you have tradition and you have these very progressive things that people are trying to do but Augusta has a way of just evolving tradition, which I don't think that it's hard it, to do. It's very hard. It's funny, to do. it's like we're like very minded. We're like sharing a brain. I just said almost those same exact words a couple of days ago. That while always holding dear to the tradition and the rich history that defines it, Augusta is always evolving, and it's so rare. It's it's just such a unique energy, I guess is is the best way to do it. I know you love fashion. So I can't imagine what it's like when you go to the merch building. <laughs> All right, you need to break this down for me. What What is your philosophy and your strategy when you walk in there? You know, that's that's probably the most helpless uh, <laughs> merchandise. That's the most helpless consumer experience I've ever had. You just say, you, here's the card. Yeah, it's just, it's crazy. It's You know, there's so many people there and there's so many things and in the back of your mind, you got like this unsubstantiated fear that like the thing that you're looking at is not going to be there in five seconds if you don't get it right then and there. And then, unfortunately, you don't have your phone, so it's nobody to talk you off the ledge. The time I've, the times I've been down here, you know, I'm I'm by myself. That's another 
bad move. You should always go in there with somebody. Bring a support person with you, a support <laughs> shopper. Uh, but I go in there, and then the thoughts that start crossing your mind, like, but I could wear this with this. I could oh, yeah. pair this with that. My dad might like this. What about my mom? What about my cousins? What about that one guy that I'm probably going to play with at some point in time that's probably going to know that I went to the Masters and want something? Like, I'm just all these scenarios that I start to go through in my head about stuff that I should buy. And then, you know, I get this box of stuff shipped back to the house and my girl sees it and she just Why didn't it. you give me anything? <laughs> <laughs> Even if I get her stuff, it's still she just shaking her head like, what are you going to do with all of this stuff? Like, I don't know, but I don't need to know, you know, but it's... The, what is the one item that all your boys, before you come down here, say, Raj, you got to get me this? They want hats, probably. Yeah, the hats. The hats. The hat games are crazy. You know, the buckets, they evolve every – I'm a big bucket guy. I know guy. you're a big bucket guy. You'll get one yet? Yeah, not yet. Not yet. I'm trying to just I'm – I'm letting the, the fans, all of the patrons, I'm letting them get their, their pass at everything, and then I'll go in there and get some of the scraps, you know, even though I know that they restock it like every minute on a minute or something like that. But, but no, it's just uh, I'm, I'm always – I'm always – impressed at how they managed to lure my dollars out of my pockets Me when too. I walk in. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's it's amazing. And then the gnome thing. <laughs> the people lined up at dawn for the gnome. How, how quickly did they sell out? Yeah, Immediately. Yeah. I mean, as soon as they opened the door. And it was like a one per person. Or it was some type of limit that they put on them, and they still sold out instantly. It doesn't, it doesn't matter what limit they put on them. They're going to be gone. <laughs> you know, I was standing on the first fairway this morning waiting on Tony Finau to tee off because I was going to do a walk and talk shoot with him on the second for ESPN. So I'm standing there and so many people are coming over to say hello. And this one guy walks up and he has this kind of unique look on his face. And he goes, Marty, um, look across the tee box there. And I look across and there's a nice lady waving at me. He goes, that's the future Miss McNulty. And I said, future. He goes, I just proposed to my fiance right over there in front of the clubhouse. He said, I've been waiting my whole life, more than 30 years, to come here and see this in person. And this is the first time I've ever been here. And I got to propose to my fiance today. I'm like, I guess that means she said yes, <laughs> since you're calling her your fiance. But that's just another one of those stories that people wait to have the energy here in order to accentuate the energy of a moment that's that landmark in a life. Yeah. What is the wildest thing you've seen? Uh, it's just, you know, as I, 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 you know, I have no problem talking to people very extroverted, but I go out here and I just hear like how hard people have worked to get here. Uh, you know, 15, 20 years in the lottery system and they finally got it and, you know, they're bringing their friends with them and you see their eyes start to tear up about like, man, this is better than I ever imagined. And I just, you know, the, I mean, it's just, it's just kudos to to the culture that they've built around the event, uh, but it's, it's, it's special to a lot of people. And I just, I see a lot of first timers that are here, you know, bringing people. I see people that worked here, you know, I was talking to one lady, she she said, I worked here in 97 when Tiger won his first, won, won his first Masters, and now I bring, like anytime I get tickets, I always bring someone for their first time when they come just because I understand the power that, that cool. this has. And so then she was with the, it was a lady that was with a group of girls. So she had two girls with the, that was, that was their first time coming and one girl that was the, her second time coming. And the girl that was there for the second time was like, you know, I play golf all the time now because she brought me to the Masters last year. And then the girls that just got here, just like, I can't wait to leave Augusta so I can make golf a part of my life. This is insane. So I just don't think that there's a lot of other venues, a lot of other events that has that type of power over people. Um, and, you know, it's just, it just, you know, it, it's no secret why it's, you know, such a, such a coveted experience by so many. You know, to Tiger a second ago and what he did in 1997, I was talking to him earlier today and, he mentioned that victory, and he actually said, I got lucky in 97, as if he didn't run away from the field in 1997. But I would love to have your perspective on what you believe he's done for the game of golf. And I know it's, like, impossible to encapsulate, yeah. but what's your what's your thought on that? I think that, you know, what, what Tiger has done, it's a, it's a twofold thing, right? And this is uh, an interesting subject. Tiger has been a great ambassador for what greatness looks like. 
you know, he he showed us with dedication, with 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 focus, uh, with intensity, with love in the work and love in the process, what you can achieve. You know, because I would like to think that all of us start off as these people that you know, you know, we have this limitless potential, but who's going to put in the work to unlock it? And he was just a great represent representation. And this is, you know, the independent of race, the racial implications, but he's just a great representation of what happens when a human puts in the effort to maximize their potential. And and so, like, as, you know, as a golfer, I, I look to him when whenever I'm, you know, whatever type of competitions I play in. And I just try to always tap into that mentality when I'm off the course of just doing the work and, and trusting the work and, and letting the work take care of the result. Um, I think that a lot of people sometimes, especially in the black community, we look at Tiger and, and and sometimes they ask, could he have done more for, you know, for advancing the culture of the sport in a more direct way, you know? And when people bring that to me, I say, you have no idea how hard it was for him to do what he did when he was doing it in 97, you know, to be a, a young black man coming out and just really shaking up the game like that, to think through like the threats that must have happened and just like some of the resistance that he must have faced throughout his career and changing the game as much as he has. Um, I just don't think that it was any easy task for him to put the game and the diversity of the game on his shoulders the way that he did. And I just want to tell Tiger like, you know, just a real job well done for everything that you've done personally uh, to carve out this lane so that people feel comfortable representing themselves and know that if they do put in the work, they can be great, you know, because that's that's what he means to me. If you put in the effort, you can achieve, you know, and so I, I know that, you know, it's, it's, and this may, may not even be the, the best, you know, the best topic or like the best way to frame this, uh, that question, you know, given where we are, but I just, I just think that Tiger has done an immense amount for the game and, and anybody that scrutinizes this, scrutinizes that in any way has no idea what he's been through uh, paving the way that he has and doing it the way that he has. Extremely well said. And and not only that, it's with that dominance comes that platform. And with that platform comes all of that pressure and yeah. all of that expectation. And he didn't just win. He didn't just thrive. He rewrote every single record. Every wrote. single one. Every single one, man. While carrying that. Yeah. And it's just remarkable to me. And it's just, you know, like a lot of times we look at, you know, these these figures in the game and we expect them to be so much more than just like what they're good at. Like Tiger loves to play golf. And he is, you know, in my opinion, the best to ever do it. And it's like the fact that we take someone that has this very rare skill set in this one segment and we apply all of this pressure to him to be everything to everybody else. Um, it's just it's kind of unfair a bit, you know, but I think that with all of the pressure that Tiger has had on himself and still trying to figure out, you know, who he is as a man and the things that he wants to represent beyond the game, I think that he's done, you know, a great job, especially in this, you know, these last years of, you know, showing us what he's like as a father. Know, showing us what he's like as a mentor, you know, and, and really taking a, a bunch of players under his wing to make sure that they have the knowledge so that they can continue to push the game forward. Like, I, I just think that he's done for, for all of the responsibility that comes with the greatness that he has. Uh, he's done a great job at, at, at managing my expectations of him as, you know, the greatest to ever do it. Well, he told me that the competitive fire within still burns every bit as hot it. as it ever has. And... He believes he can still win here. Oh, you see it. And so it'll be fascinating to see how this week unfolds for him. I would love nothing more than on Sunday afternoon for for those roars to be for him because it's just a different energy, man. 2019 here was electric in a way. I mean, it was almost irreverent in a way Augusta is never irreverent. The yeah. people were on a heater, <laughs> and it was wonderful – to witness. Uh, all right, I'll get you out of here on this. You got to pick somebody. You got to pick a winner for me. Who you got? I mean, it's just it's just hard not to think that Scheffler's not going <laughs> to win. It's just, you know, I just feel like he's been kind of, you know, he laid dormant and kind of, I, I felt like he laid down at that, you know, that last start that he had on the last hole just to make sure that the buzz stayed low so he could do what he needed to do here. But, I mean, he's just playing a level of golf that we just haven't seen uh, in a very, very long time. And I, 
I do expect him to to come out and make a strong showing. But you know, I just there's a there's a lot of really really good golfers in the field, and it's just great that we have the opportunity to have them all back here, uh, competing Amen. against each other. Well this stated. Is, this is great. Thank you, brother. I appreciate you no, always. I appreciate you. I appreciate you. Roger Steele. Augusta National founder Bobby Jones is considered the greatest amateur golfer ever. And since its inception, he stressed the importance of using the Masters platform to elevate the future of the game. This year, there are five amateurs on site. I climbed up in the crow's nest, the historic perch atop the Augusta National Clubhouse that houses amateur players during Masters Week. Some of the greatest golfers who ever lived have stayed there, including Jack Nicklaus, Tom Watson, and Tiger Woods. About his stay in the crow's nest 29 years ago, Woods said, quote, It was the ultimate to be able to stay in the crow's nest and to watch Byron Nelson, Sam Sneed, and Gene Sarazen tee off on the first hole. In the field this week and visiting the crow's nest are Asia-Pacific amateur champion Jasper Stubbs and Latin America amateur champion Santiago de la Fuente. Jasper Stubbs and Santiago de la Fuente. If you ever heard your name, I get I me. Mean, you're, you're from Houston. You hear some country boys say your name, right? I've heard some weird stuff. <laughs> I did all right, right? You were good. These gentlemen have the great opportunity to play in the 88th Masters tournament. Let's just start right there. Uh, you guys are youngins, but I'm sure since you started the game, this has been in your dreams. So, how has your experience so far? I know we're just starting the week, but sort of intersected those dreams. Yeah, it's obviously been a lifelong dream to come play the Masters, and I think all the expectations you have growing up as a kid once you get here, they're all they're all met. Absolutely, um, it's an amazing place, and yeah, it's spoken of so highly, but yeah, definitely worth the wait. That is one crazy thing about Augusta National is they can tell you, but whatever your expectations are, it seems to exceed it every time, right? Every time, I feel like. Everyone is a golfer when they're on the putting green or the driving, the driving range or whatever. We're saying we have a four or five foot and we're like, this is to win the Masters or this is to win whatever tournament. And for me, having this opportunity to play in the Masters and probably win, I mean, who knows? It's, it's a dream come true. It is. And it's such a, a wonderful opportunity. You both earned your opportunity. There will be people watching who don't know how you guys earned your way in. Jasper, you start, share with us how you got here. Yeah, I won my way through the, the Asia Pacific Amateur in a, in a two-hole playoff down at Royal Melbourne. Pretty good, kid. Pretty good. It was very, very good sudden death playoff. I thought I'd, I'd, I'd clutched it on the, the first playoff hole, but yeah, I got it answered straight back and then had to do it again a whole nother time. But When that's the context in which you earn a master's invitation, and you're standing there a victor. When does that emotion kind of hit you and the realization that, holy smokes, I'm going to play in the Masters? Yeah. Yeah, it still didn't seem real. Even when I'd, when I'd had the trophy and I was doing all the presses afterwards, um, it still took yeah a couple of weeks or maybe even a month until the invitation arrived. And it's like, well, that's it. Like, I've got to go now because <laughs> I'm in. So, um, yeah, it took a while, but it was awesome. That's the single most coveted piece of mail probably that <laughs> when that shows up in the mail how, how do you how do you open it did you are, are you a social media guys did you make sure that you were capturing the moment i mean i i facetime my friends because i mean my my friends are back home so i facetime them and we open it together and it was a very special moment i mean it, it, how about you i mean when you open that mail yeah, I mean, I waited for my family to get home from, from whatever they were doing on the day, and we all opened it together. Had a video, and lots of screaming and shouting, that's for sure. It was awesome. Yeah. I just, I mean, it's the ultimate. And so, Santiago, share with, with our, our folks how you qualified for the match. I won the 2024 Latin America Amateur Championship in Panama, which it was my fourth lack, and it was very special. All right, so you're both going to have a, a wonderful opportunity starting Thursday. How will you define success this week, Jasper? Yeah, I mean, there's there's different levels to it for me. Um, I mean, I'd, I'd love to just have a good week, and I think I'm already sort of starting to do that. So it's it's been a fun week and one I'll remember forever. And then sort of gradually you, you make the cut, 
that's the next goal and then you work your way up trying to get back to next year with the top 12 and then low M um, would be awesome as well and I guess everyone the one thing on everyone's mind is a green jacket so I mean that that would be a great success it, it would be an historic mm -hmm. one mm -hmm. sir <laughs> yeah. how about you I will say just learning from this experience because uh, there's a long way in this golfing career so if the most the more I can learn about this, the better. So I will say that's that's the way to succeed for me. It's one of the things that makes the Masters so special is that annual tradition that Bobby Jones wanted so deeply to champion you guys as amateur players. When you think about his conviction, the guy that made all of this happen, what's that tell you about his devotion and the club's devotion to, to maintaining his wishes? Yeah, I mean, it's amazing. And even the players um, professionally respect those wishes as well. They come up to you and they say congratulations because they know that you're an amateur because they've never seen your face before. But they know, you, <laughs> they know you've done something amazing to, to get a ticket to the Masters. So, yeah, it's pretty cool to have that happen. Who's the coolest person you guys have met so far? I play with Ola Savo today. Oh, my word. Legend, man. It was very cool. What stories did he share? Not many, but a lot of knowledge from here. Uh, you gonna give any up? <laughs> no, <laughs> I don't blame you. How about you? Yeah, I've met um, uh, Adam Scott, obviously, um, Cam Smith, and Jason Day while I've been here, which has been pretty cool, obviously, all from back home. So they're guys I've looked up to for a while now, and it's pretty cool to be playing on the same course as them for the week. I was gonna ask you about those guys. All three of those guys are world class dudes. Yeah. They are just such good, good men. Yeah. When you're following in, in that kind of footsteps and you do grow up looking up to them, what, what's it like when they acknowledge your career? Yeah, it's it's really cool to, to think that they'd know what you've done because obviously growing up as a kid, you've watched every golf shot they've probably hit for five to ten years. And um, yeah, to think that they've watched any of mine is pretty cool. Well, I'm uh, so thrilled for both of you. Thank you for your time. Best of luck this week. Congratulations on your tremendous success. And if one of you two is wearing a green jacket Sunday evening, I'll see you for the big ESPN interview too, I guess. <laughs> Sounds Thank good. you so much. Have fun Thank this you. week, guys. Thank yes. you. Those young men have very bright futures in the game, and we wish them well as they attack the Masters for the first time. Coming up on our next episode, we're joined by Rick Shields and Seb Carmichael Brown, two great golf personalities, as well as Dude Perfect, 15 years to the day after it all began for them. Thank you so much for spending your time with us here during Masters Week on 4Please Now Driving, the official Masters podcast.